was the development process at HBO different than the development process at DreamWorks? Yes, well, I met the people at DreamWorks. Okay. N didn't ever that's meet a big, anyone. That's yeah, a help. That's a huge thing. <laughs> you I watched didn't... HBO. Which... I watched right. HBO. That was about as close. I had a subscription. That was right. about as close as I got to ever meeting anyone there. Oh, that's um, interesting. No, I only did the one draft for them, and okay. they passed on it, and right. then it just died, essentially. And then... Uh... Well, I'm sure those people have been accounted for. <laughs> well, I don't know. But, right. you know, I... I ended up just, just begging and pleading for a meeting at DreamWorks, and right. they like, uh, uh, you know, canceled it like three or four mm -hmm. times, and finally, right. had nothing better to do than to mm -hmm. meet me, right. and, and I got to pitch it to them, and then and then they bought it. They bought that that draft that did at HBO. That was a, a, a nice experience of making the the film at the right time with the right cast and the right director. Yeah, absolutely. Just, just you hung in there with it, and uh, it's yeah. a good lesson in not giving up on a project. Huge, huge lesson that I learned because I was so frustrated. Right. You know, I'm, I'm a struggling screenwriter, and I know if we can just make this script right. that I'm getting so many meetings and so many people seem to like that if they could just make it, and you've got good right. people, Fernando Morellis and yeah. all these fantastic directors, make the thing. Right. And it was in insanely frustrating. In the end, after about three years, I was like, well... I got to the kind of zen point where it's, well, it's kind of a win-win now because right. everyone's read that script and they all like it. So if the film gets made now and they screw it up, then at least everyone knows I wrote right. a good script, you know? And if they make it and it's good, then it's good. So right. it was win-win after a did, while. Did it feel very um, validating when, when that, that sentiment was, was shared by Michael Mann and Tom Cruise? Yeah, absolutely. Stuff? Well, I mean, that's validating, you know, 15 years ago as a high schooler having right. an idea. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was great. It was great. Really great. Um, how important is discipline to your work habits? Is, uh, do, you, are you, do you follow a pretty regimented yeah. routine? Or? Yeah, well, I have kids, so I have to be disciplined. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I do very much nine to like five thirty, nine thirty to five thirty, really every day, Monday through Friday. You know, keep those bankers' hours. Right. Absolutely. Uh, otherwise, I'd never get anything done. Mm -hmm. You have to know when to start, when to stop. Right. Um, before I had a family, I would just go, 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 and I would just burn out and flame out and write right. crap. So actually having those boundaries and starting and stopping is really good because it allows you to recharge. You, know, you play with the kids, run in the pool, you know, and you recharge. Right. And then usually once they go to bed, I, I go back to it like 8.30, 9 o'clock, and I write for another three or four hours then. So you find that the specific timeline with certain goals has actually helped your process as a writer? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, because it, it gives you, you know, you've got another half hour. Mm -hmm. oh, I better get this done, right. you know, and think, 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 and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Do you follow any rituals when you're writing in terms of like, do you listen to music or go to certain locations to no, write? No, or... I, can't, I can't listen to music. That mm -hmm. just makes me listen to music. Right. And uh, I, I don't know, I know a lot of writers do that. I don't know how they do it. Right. I need silence. I need, I turn off the phone. I turn off the email. Right. You know, and I just sink into that world and I disappear. And, uh, and it's usually best just at home in my computer and, you know, because I know my family's there and, and the whole support system is there. Right. But, uh, you know, I've written a lot on location and a lot on just offices anywhere. But as long as I get that, I need that silence, quiet, mm -hmm. no disturbing, you know, to really get a rhythm going right. and, and get it done. Do yeah. you read while you're writing or do you not read books or anything? Oh, God, no. No, I had time. It's, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you're so sick of reading. I mean, you, you're reading your words again and again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at the end of the day, the last thing you want to do is read some more. Read some more. You mentioned you have other people read your work to kind of like give yep. you op opinions that you trust. Um, who's that support group kind of in your life? My agent, Nancy. Mm -hmm. um, my lawyer, Joan. Uh, my wife, Kim. Any other screenwriters? Uh, no, I don't actually, mm -hmm. no. Um, Is that on purpose? No, just that I don't know any that well that, right. you know, I mean, I'd love to get Steve Zalian to you, know, but I know him, you know. Right. Um, and, you know, would they, they wouldn't have time. And I know everyone's, you know, mm -hmm. writers are really busy, so I, I don't. Right. I don't kind of seek that out, I guess. Mm -hmm. I probably could seek it out if I wanted to. I have writer friends, but I just don't want to, I don't want to belabor them with uh, right. my script. They've got more important things to do. Mm -hmm. In the past, uh, have any screenplays that you've really admired helped you in your own work when you think back to them or... Oh, yeah. I mean, all the Larry Katzen stuff, right. you know, uh, I think Usual Suspects. You know, we, we actually just did the, the top ten, you know, for the Writers Guild. They asked us to fill it out, and I was... So it started made me thinking about great scripts that I admire. Oh, they asked uh, everyone's personal top ten? Yeah, right, exactly. And I have a library of probably a hundred scripts of okay. my favorite scripts, and I'm always going back and referring to them and referring to them again and again. How do they do that? What was that? How was that set up? How mm -hmm. was that written? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, it's personal reference library. Yeah, it's great. Now, how many screenplays did you write before... The, kind of your breakthrough? Uh, I mean, well, before like selling Collateral, because that was really it, okay. I guess, as a breakthrough. Um, well, I wrote Collateral, I wrote Pirates, I wrote a film about tunnel rats in Vietnam, mm -hmm. I wrote a film noir, a spoof of, Doc, of James Bond. So you really tried a lot of different genres? Yeah, a lot of different mm -hmm. genres, yeah. Um, 
uh, seven or eight. Right. Let's say that just to stop mm -hmm. counting. <laughs> About seven or eight before different scripts. Right. Uh, but tons of drafts of all those. Mm -hmm. How did the Pirates experience come about? Um, Pirates, um, basically, I was, I was at Oregon State, and I was hanging out for the summer with a friend, and we were like, let's write a movie. <laughs> He'd never written, right. but he liked that I was writing. I was like, let's do that. It's like, OK, well, what's the movie that hasn't been done in a while? And we were thinking, thinking, and suddenly we both kind of said, Pirates. That hasn't been done since you know, Errol Flynn. Right. Fantastic. Research, I take it you're not a big fan of Cutthroat Island. No, unfortunately, Cutthroat Island, you know, it, just, it was just missing stakes. Right. You know, there was no stakes. If they didn't get the gold, then right. when they didn't get the gold in the end, they're like, right. oh, skipping pirates. It's funny too because there was another one. There was a Walter. There was a Polanski pirate movie, Walter Matthau, mm. and I think people just shut the door on that subgenre. And like any genre, if you do a good one, yeah, you know. it's so unfair to say pirate movies are out because two bad pirate movies right. get made, or thrillers are out, or westerns are out. Good stories right. are in, bad stories are out. Always have been, always will be. Right. Simple as that. Yeah. So I ended up writing this thing. It was called Quest of the Caribbean because I couldn't use the actual. Right. Pirates of the Caribbean then. But it had all the scenes from the Rhine. It was the tongue-in-cheek, the Raiders, the Lost Ark mm -hmm. version of Pirates. And uh, we sent that around town and got lots of meetings, a lot of people interested, but it never ended up getting bought. And then years later, I had sold Collateral. It was in the period before it got made. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had submitted it again to Disney, saying, come on, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. And they said, no, 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 no. We're actually working on our own now. And so they had hired a writer, their in-house writer, and, and he was doing mm -hmm. a draft. And I was like, okay. But they were like, let's work on, that we wanted to do 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. So uh, I was working on that. And then they were like, you know, we're not happy with the drafts for this previous show. Would you like a go at it now uh -huh. at Pirates? And I was like, well, I've been asking for 10 <laughs> fucking right. years. Yes, please. So I went in, pitched, and got the job. And I did two drafts, basically. I did uh, the draft that kind of got it going. And then mm -hmm. got Brookheimer and everyone did a draft for him and Johnny and all right. those people. And then, uh, and then Ted and Terry came mm -hmm. on and did the whole ghost thing. I was told specifically, no supernatural right. when I was pitching. <laughs> right. don't just, we don't want to do ghost skeletons, all right? right. And I was like, okay. Then Ted and Terry came in, ghost skeletons, fantastic, you know? Right. But they had you know, the Oscar nomination for Shrek and right. big writers. Now, in an environment like that, where it's, it's such a corporation and the ride is you know, such a part of the theme mm -hmm. parks and the film, it's gonna be this huge event. Do you feel the pressure of that in the process, or is it just, or they, was it kept kind of pure and you were the writer and, and it was more of a creative? Yeah, process? it was actually really well done. They, uh, what, what worked, why, why Pirates worked was because the Disney executives, the senior executives, really knew the film they wanted to make and it was the right film to make. Gotcha. So, right from the start, it was PG 13. Like the first meeting I had, I said, This is uh -huh. PG 13. I said, Yes, that's what we want. And they just, they just got it and they just let us do what we did. And, uh, I think it worked because of that. Mm -hmm. Smart people who knew what they wanted right. and let us deliver it for them. Yeah. Do you think um, for, for a writer starting out, it's important to, for them to write a lot of bad screenplays before they write the first good one? Is it, do, you, do you get those out of your system kind of and refine your skills? Yeah, well, I just think it's impossible to write a good screenplay first off. Right. I mean, if you do that, you're Houdini. Mm -hmm. Good on you. And maybe you don't. I don't think you right. need, I just think it's natural. Right. You know, it's like a doctor performing a surgery. The first one's going to be genius, right. not going to leave any scars. You know? right. No, it comes after years of work and work and work and practice. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, naturally, your first scripts suck. Mm -hmm. Don't think that at the time, though, right. you know. I know, it's them later. Right. I know it's early in your career, but do, do, do you feel like, what's the, what's the best thing you feel you've written so far? Best thing? Uh, probably a screenplay called uh, Truce. It's a World War I movie uh, about the Christmas truce in mm -hmm. the trenches. Um, we're hoping to get it made next year. Was that the soccer game? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They end up playing a game of soccer. You know, peace is possible. Right. A good message for today. What was the story uh, behind that again? It was the it was the the Germans and the British. Yeah, and Germans and the British. In, yeah, in trenches across yeah. the field. Yeah, yeah. But what was great about it was that it was the guys on the front line, the generals mm -hmm. in both the rear lines, were saying, "No, no, 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 you can't do that." Right. You know, forty miles behind in their French chateaus. No, 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 you can't. But the guys at the front were like. This is bullshit. What the hell are we fighting for? This is we're gonna we're, we're just killing each other. I mean, they'd had a million people being killed in right. four months. Never seen a war like this. We're at a dead standstill. It's the middle of friggin' winter, and we're just shivering here and shivering and hoping we don't die. We were told we were going to be home by Christmas. Mm -hmm. This war would be over by then, and we're still here. Right. And what is the point of this? Why why can't we just say you know let's put down the guns just for a day, right. get our humanity back for God's sake? You know, can we just be people again? And it was really, I think, the last great act of 
humanity and war. And yeah. uh, and and what did, and they played. They got out of their yeah. They, they, yeah. They, they they you know against orders. They were going to be shot if they left their trench because you know rumblings had been in the yeah. trenches and the generals had found out. And if anyone leaves their trenches, you'll be shot by your own people. You know, but they did it anyway. And uh, and it was one of those those to great, play a soccer game, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. They tra had haircuts. Right. They traded stories and realized they had the same girlfriends. Right. You know, just incredible stories. Um, and end up playing a game of soccer, and the Germans won. <laughs> so only, only thing they won in that whole war. Right. You say it's the best thing you feel you've written. What has I think been, so. What has been the, uh, the, the impediment to getting that made or getting a, a movie that you feel is that high it's, quality with a good message it's, made? It's, uh, what are the challenges? Of it's period, mm -hmm. and it's a bunch of guys in uniform and mud. Right. Not very commercial. Right. What's the poster? What's the, you know? Is that what you get hit with a lot with, mm. with things that Absolutely. aren't necessarily high concept? But yeah, not a comedy. Right. You know, we want to have right. people rolling in the aisles as people get slaughtered. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you find that demoralizing, or do you take it in stride that like it's just part of the business? Yeah, it's demoralizing. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it's it's two years of blood, sweat, and tears, and something that everyone agrees is great. Right. You know, I go on meetings around town, and people everywhere seem to have read that script right. and, and come out of the, their way to say, "Hey, look, I read this script." Um, so, and it seems to connect with people and say right. things. You know, this is why I got in the business for scripts like this. You know. Well, no one can make it, you know. Right. Uh, but hopefully, hopefully we'll get it made next year. Right. There was another film that came out this year, a French film that had the same subject, and they just didn't want to conflict. Right. But yeah, it's frustrating. But that, again, but it is the business. Right. And thank God it's not the only script I've written. Mm -hmm. It can never be the only script you've ever written. For as much as love and passion you have for something, it can never be the only egg in your basket because that's a recipe for disaster in right. this town. Um, do you find that directors, certain directors, might help getting a film like that made? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it, it uh, helps get heat going. You know, people won't argue with those kinds of people. Mm -hmm. People will uh, just start getting things done right. because those people have very specific windows to mm -hmm. get things done in. And you've got to jump now or you, you're going to lose them. Right. So it, it tends to get things going a lot faster, yeah. If I remember correctly, was it, was it Russell Crowe's initial interest that got yeah. heat on Collateral? Yeah, in Collateral, yeah. It was just sitting there. Mm -hmm. And then he had a film fall through, so he had, again, a very short window. Right. And, uh, and my agent called up and said, hey, give Russell collateral. Right. And I'm, oh, okay. So they gave Russell collateral, and, and, and he came on, and uh, that got Michael Mann on. And, right. then, and then, you know, negotiations happened, and Russell mm -hmm. dropped out, and Tom came on. That's, but that's what got that going after right. three years of doing all the roundtables in Hollywood, yeah. Do you um, keep tabs on the, the big scripts that sell over the course of a year? Or, have you ever read anything and, and said, man, I wish I'd written that? Oh, absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, all the time. Um, I don't get so much time anymore today to right. read scripts that sell, but certainly as I was starting out, I would follow scripts, I would, follow, I would get the drafts as they were turned in mm -hmm. at Prince just to see the, the difference in the drafts and things right. like that. It's a very educational experience, yeah, and it's, it's fun. It's fun, and, and of course it's heartbreaking, of course, when you right. see a crappy film that comes out, and it was such a good script, right. you know. Um, Beyond Rangoon was one of my favorite scripts. Amazing script and just got right. rewritten somewhere along the way. Right. Completely different film. Um, First Night, Bill Nicholson. Amazing script. I remember script. that script. That was you an remember amazing that? script, yeah. Oh my God, made you cry. Yeah. And just somewhere along the way, just got yeah. lost. What do you think happens in, the, in, the, in a case where it's, it's a, everyone agrees, you know, as much as you can agree that this was a great screenplay, but the film doesn't live up to, to the promise? Is it. I don't know, you know, there's that old yeah. joke, you know, it was a great idea, it was a good screenplay, it was a pretty good cast, it was an okay director, it was a crappy film. Right. You know? Yeah. It's just somewhere along so the way. So many factors you, could go. So many factors, exactly. That's why a good movie is such a rare thing and such a thing to be proud of and celebrate. Right. Because all these thousands of elements came together and actually worked together in sync mm -hmm. and were the right things. So I, I just think it's just one of those businesses that takes more than right. one person. You know, a book is one person. Right. A movie is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, and they all have to right. be working at the top. For of millions the game. and millions of dollars. Millions yeah, and millions of dollars, yeah. Mm -hmm. And millions and millions of dollars starts creating millions and millions of agendas right. that aren't necessarily to make the best film possible. Right. So I just think it's just one of those businesses. Um, where do you find inspiration for, for your creativity? Um, inspiration. I get, to, I get excited about stories. Mm -hmm. I really do. It's, it's as, as basic as that, I get excited about a good story. Right. I want to be told a good story. I want to hear a great story. I want to tell a great story, share a great story. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really about that, you know, what a, a story can tell me about the world we live in or right. my life or what's going on. And Do current events move you? Current or events, yeah. yeah. I mean, the impetus for truce mm -hmm. is 
the Middle East. Right. We just cannot fucking get along. Mm -hmm. Why isn't peace the most important thing? Is it? No, it's not really. It's all about these agendas and paybacks and everything else. And why can't you just stop? Right. Just stop. You know? So you end up writing a film about World War I, you know? Right. When they did stop. Yeah. And see, look, it is possible. These people hated each other as much as you two. Don't think it can't happen. Look, it did. Mm -hmm. um, collateral, a lot of that, you know, what it really became about was just, you know, living in a city where you hear on the radio in the morning, oh, the traffic's blocked up in the 405s, a fatality accident, takes a pulvita, do this, and you're like, fatality right. accident. Someone got killed, and I'm going to be late to work. God damn it. Right. Where did that reality come the, from, the you know? Desensitivity the to, desensitivity to suffering. The desensitivity to human life, yeah. exactly. And that was Rwanda, you know, mm -hmm. a million people getting slaughtered in a hundred days, and what did we do? Right. You know, argued about what color the, the army personal carriers were gonna be when we sent them. Right. You know, it just, it just you know, and argue about what is genocide, acts of genocide may have occurred. How many acts of genocide does it take to make a genocide? You know, you see all these right. things, and it just, it just, I guess it's stuff that pisses me off in mm -hmm. the end. Stuff that keeps me up at night, stuff I end up, you know, bitching about to my wife or my friends, you right. know, it ends up becoming fodder for subject for, for stories. Do you feel yourself moving more in like a socially relevant direction for the stories that kind of pique your interest or move you right now? Um, yeah, sometimes, yeah. Or have you always been that way? Um, no, it's, it's certainly been something more and more. I guess, though, I, you know, I have all these journalist friends now. Right. Because I did this journalism degree. Right. They're in Pakistan and Afghanistan and Iraq. And so all, you get a lot of missives. So I get a lot of this, right. yeah, missives and stuff, and I, and I feel you know, somewhat responsible. But it also does affect me. I get mm -hmm. pissed off. And... Um, so yeah, a lot of the work I do has that mm -hmm. stuff, but then at the same time, there, there's, there's a lot of stuff that's just, I want pure entertainment. Right. I think, you know, 10 bucks to escape for two hours into a different world mm -hmm. is worth the 10 bucks. Right. And, and that's, it's, a, it's a good thing and, a, mm -hmm. and a, an honest thing and a noble thing, and it's, and then, and it's worthwhile doing. Right. So I kind of do both, yeah. Do you think the, the writing of a big popcorn movie requires a different skill set than the writing of something? Oh, God, mm -hmm. yeah, completely different skill set. Completely two different kinds of films, right. you know, two different kinds of writing, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got, uh, <laughs> oh God, I can't even go into right. it. But yeah, it is, it is mm -hmm. a completely different job, essentially, yeah. Do you enjoy the freedom when you're making up a whole world like Pirates? where? It, you yeah, can, yeah, mm -hmm. well, I mean, Pirates, I knew really well that world because right. I'd been writing Quest 10 years, 15 years ago, whatever mm -hmm. it was. So I knew everything about Pirates and everything that could possibly happen in that world. Right. So, yeah, I, I, I love creating those worlds, creating those characters and and just seeing what happens. Yeah, it's, it's part of the, you know, the best fun, but you get to escape mm -hmm. different times, different places, different right. people, and, you know, and, you're, and you're in these people's heads, and yeah, you just get lost. It's part of the joy of doing it. Are there any um, classic books that you've always wanted to adapt? Classic books? Well, 20,000 Leagues. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do that now for Disney. Okay. Um, that's one. Um, great book, not so great ride. Right, right, <laughs> we're gonna improve that. Right. We're gonna improve, they're gonna make an exciting mm -hmm. film and uh, it's actually quite an episodic book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's it. true. We do this, we do this, we do this, and we go all around the world, right. under the water. So we'll hopefully make some, mm -hmm. some good changes to that. Um, Tale of Two Cities, I would love to do. Uh -huh. Tale of Two Cities, I think it's a fantastic story. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, I love those kinds of stories. Right. You know, a guy does something in the end they never would have done in the beginning. Right. But because of everything they've gone through in between, Makes sense. Well, I imagine um, you can draw from things that have inspired you in terms of works of literature and just put them in new stories. Not yeah, straight exactly. Adaptation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Beauty and the Beast. Right. I, you know, I wrote a script about a mercenary and a relief worker. as Beauty and the Beast. Mm -hmm. You know, essentially that. There are only so, so many kinds of archetypes, right. you know, and, and you just look at and you recognize what kind of a story you're telling. And you go, oh, it's that kind of story. Well, I can now do this, this, and this. You know, right. It opens up this, this, and this for me. Absolutely. You've got to know the classic stories because they're still the stories we're telling today. Now, having written both, um, are there, what are the differences in, in crafting a uh, kind of a more serious-minded film uh, as opposed to a big kind big of popcorn Buster movie? Thing. Yeah, big popcorn movie. Is it? It's it's apples and oranges, which are both fruit. They're different. They're, they're different. Right. Um, yeah, it's completely different. It's uh, the big blockbusters. You have to have a certain amount of spectacle. Mm -hmm. That's why they're blockbusters. You have to have that eye candy that people come back to see again and again and again. So that usually means more complicated plots and just more stuff going on. Right. Car chases, explosions, exciting moments, all that kind of stuff. And it kind of, what it does is it, 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 you know, the plot stuff expands and the character stuff shrinks. 
So, so you have less of that breathing room you, you mentioned that you Yeah, like. right. Like, I like simple stories with complex characters because right. then I've got you know, this much story and this much character going on. So blockbusters, you know, the character stuff goes down and the, mm -hmm. the plot stuff goes up. So it's really about finding you know, the same amount of great character stuff but saying it quicker or getting it in a more succinct way. You know, you don't right. have a lot of time to set up characters. You don't have, you know, you've got to get the plot rolling. You've got to, you know, there's things like that. You know, collateral, something like collateral, something like truce takes its time, right. you know, in, in blockbusters, you're hitting them, you're hitting them, you, you got to, you know, mm -hmm. get them in their seats, you got to, you know, provide those thrills, you got to have them, you know, jumping right. up and down and all, all over the stuff. So right. it's, it's a ride, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a difference of a roller coaster ride and uh, a ride in a horse carriage around the right. park. You know, the, it's, it's just a different beast right. completely. Just as fun, just as many challenges, right. but a completely different beast. Do, uh, do you call on kind of your memories of seeing the popcorn movies you've, you've enjoyed oh, over the years? Oh, absolutely, yeah, as yeah. Where is Raiders today? Right. Why don't we have a Raiders? Right you know, one. We, yeah, well, <laughs> I know, that's what I'm trying to do. Right. Um, exactly. You know, it, yeah, it's all those movies from my youth that made mm -hmm. me want to get into this. They were all the popcorn movies, right. the Die Hards, the, you know, um, uh, Empire, you know, the sure. Star Wars films, mm -hmm. all that good stuff. They were the films that really made me want to be a filmmaker. So, right. yeah, um, Recalling those, right. recalling the excitement, being that ten-year-old kid in the theater again, right. writing for that kid is mm -hmm. is a big part of, of doing those kinds of films. Right. Yeah. Do you think that um, you know, as a as a lover of movies and as a patron of those kind of movies, do you think um, the earlier kind of you know seventies and eighties blockbusters had better or tighter screenplays than the ones that some some of the ones that the studios come out with now? Is, um, yeah. So it feels like I mean, everybody's in a race now to get those out, and right. sometimes they, the corners they cut are the... Yeah, it's the sad. Story. I mean, there are some good ones today, the sure. Spider-Man films, mm -hmm. things like that. You know. I think part of the problem is uh, there aren't enough screenwriting exercises that writers follow to produce the kind of blockbusters that we enjoyed as children. So I'm going to help you out today okay. by bringing you to the part of our show where we bring you your screenwriting exercise. Oh, God. Okay, here's the test. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. We call it the object. Okay. I'm going to call for trusty Norris. Call He's going to bring object. the tray out. Norris, the tray. The tray. Don't be scared. Nothing's going to jump out at me, is it? No, the way this works is <laughs> Norris will release the, or pull Animal. up the cover, <laughs> release the dove. We'll release okay. the, uh, we'll pull the, the cover off the tray and you'll see your object. Okay. So the idea is to tell me its story. Whatever you want to make up, or whatever The story you, of the object? The story of the object. How the story about the object, it's really... How came to be on the tray? Um, anything you want. Anything that <laughs> inspires you after he, he picks that oh cover up. And then okay. tell me why you chose what you chose. Okay. Are you ready? Do you have it? Ready as I'll ever be. Your object, sir. Now that appears to be... My God. A Nazi passport. Is this passport. real? We, yeah, we don't screw around. Oh, my God. Well, it's a passport of a woman. Um... Looks like she was born in 1902. Well, I think, uh, I think this was a woman uh, trying to survive Nazi Germany. Um, you know, Hitler's in power in 33. She would have been about 30 years old. You know, she's, she just looks like she's 33 years old in this photo. And I think, I don't think she's really a Nazi, though. I think she's really trying to escape mm. and trying to survive as best she can. In, uh, in Nazi Germany by getting the passport, getting, you know, the fake document. I think they're fake documents. And I think this is her, uh, this is her passport out. This is her way out. It looks like she gets out in 1944. Oh, it yeah, passport expires 4th of August, 1945. And there she is getting out. So I think, uh, I think this woman, this is wild. Um, the German Reich. Uh, yeah, I think this is a, a woman. She's probably Jewish. Maybe she, you know, uh, third or fourth generation or something. So, you know, the name mm -hmm. maybe might not you know, ring any bells. The look might not ring any bells. Mm -hmm. But sooner or later, they're going to find out. And she's got to get out. And uh, this, is, this is like Casablanca. This is the, right. you know, the, the, free, the free pass out. If she can just get it and get it signed. And if it can just pass the border. And there's a great scene at the end where she's is this thing going to work? Is it going to work? And it's really not about the passport in the end that gets her across. It's that she's become strong, become confident, become woman, hmm. become someone who, when they look her in the eye, they believe that she says, yes, I'm German, right. and I'll be back in a week. And they believe it. 
the woman who initially you know, was going to the, the gas chamber, who was trying to get a passport like this, was, was mm -hmm. not full of confidence. You know, totally, you know, if she got up to the border with this pass, they still would have gone, this is fake. Right. And she would, yes, it is, I'm sorry, I got it. You know, she <laughs> right. would have cracked. But the woman who gets out with this pass, it's not about the pass in the end. The movie's called The Pass. <laughs> but it's not about the past right. at the end. It's about her becoming stronger, becoming, you know, the, the person who, who looks the person in the eye and, and, uh, and gets across that way. The past becomes relevant. Well, that's a pretty good job because I know it's hard <laughs> to recover from Nazi passport <laughs> as an intro. However, <laughs> um, it's interesting. You made some interesting choices. You went kind of to this romantic thriller yes. genre. Yes. Mm -hmm. And why did you choose the things you chose? Um... It just was interesting to me. I, I, um, certainly as a film, it'd be hard to, to write a film about a Nazi unless it's you know, Oscar Schindler. Right. Um, so it just seemed to me, I mean, and this has been, look at the way this has been kept. It's, mm -hmm. it's in pristine condition. Someone treasured this. Right. How many people treasure Nazi passes? Right. You know, the Nazis, well, that's just a pass, doesn't right. it? But someone who, this is gold to. Right. This a lot is of memories. life. Right. The pass is mm -hmm. life. Right. <laughs> no cribbing from <laughs> other films. Um, yeah, that, uh, and in, mm -hmm. so it just seemed interesting. Someone who was posing as something that they weren't. Right. In order, f you know, people did mm -hmm. desperate things in those times right. to escape uh, the gas chambers. So I can imagine. A and Jew, you went right to, you went to character, which is what you. Yeah, you said. back to character. Mm -hmm. A Jew having to do the most revolting, disgusting, reviling mm -hmm. thing in order to survive, which right. is to say she is a Nazi. And the journey of that, you know, the mm -hmm. important thing is the journey. She starts off. Not, no confidence right. in all and becomes, and the past becomes irrelevant. That's, that's a big part of it too. Well, I think you did a hell of a job because that, that was a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you.